So hello everyone. We're here. I'm looking for the invite button so I can invite people today. And there it is. Now I see it. Um, and then after I do that, we will pray. Um, Um, Rayburn. Okay. And we'll start praying. Father, I ask you to bless our time together. I ask you to be with us. I ask you to be with all those, Father, that are um, trying to come to the study tonight. And I ask you to be with us and just teach us about you. We want to know you better. And we, we want to know about you too, but we really want to know you. So I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we have Laurie and Mike at the safe place, everybody else's um, home. So, and then I appreciate y'all being at Gary's here and Marie Chagnon in Montreal. No, and uh, Laval, Laval. And then um, Donna's here and Strawberry's here. Okay. Well, we're picking up at, at um, John 12, 47. We're going to back up a little bit. Uh, Jesus said in, let's see, 42 and 43, he said, nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him. Uh, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess Jesus, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than they loved God. We talked about how sad that was, um, but it's a truth that's out there. And then in uh, verse 46, Jesus says, I have come as a light into the world, so that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Hi, Mary. And, and now we're in verse 47. Well, when we talked about that last time, so how can we get to the place where we still will not abide in darkness? It's most, it mostly just happens when we believe, when we be actively living in him. Hey, Lacey. And when we consistently live in the spirit, not after the flesh. Jesus is the light. In verse 47, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Recently, I was um, I was talking to someone who happened to be a homosexual man. He was on my case uh, because I had the audacity to call homosexuality sin. He tried to quote this verse to me, and he said I was judging him and that Jesus didn't judge. And I replied that Jesus didn't judge, but he will. People confuse the role of Jesus in his 33 years on the earth with his continuing role as the king of glory. There will be a judging time. And there will only be two possible verdicts, innocent or guilty. People who are guilty will not be sentenced to death because those who will be guilty are those who have remained dead spiritually, not having ever received the life of Christ in salvation. And so those people will have judged themselves um, to remain dead, and then they would basically be choosing not to go to heaven but to go to hell. So let's take a moment to address this idea of Christians and judging since it's a real popular way for people to try to, to change the topic. And so we're going to go after it right now. Often people confuse the idea of judgment with the idea that it means that the one judging is fixing a value when he or she judges. Nowhere in my thoughts about righteous judgment is there a value affixed to the person who's being judged, even when it's me. Uh, if the person truly is a Christian, his and her value will be astronomical due to the fact that the value of anything is its purchase price. And every Christian has been purchased by the life, death, blood, and suffering of Jesus. And this causes every Christian to be extremely valuable. And if, and I just parenthetically, if you're a person who doesn't feel like they have um, any innate value and you're born again, give with somebody that understands value in Christ. And receive that for yourself and renounce the idea that you're not valuable because all Christians are. In matters of judgment, the person is never the one being judged. Rather, it is his or her behavior that is being judged. And the standard used is what is most important in that judgment. So whatever we use as a ruler, 
to measure something that's that standard is the most valuable thing. That's why this verse is in the Word of God. On Matthew 7, For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And also this verse in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, For we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves, but they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. In other words, if a person's standard about their behavior is their own behavior and not something bigger than themselves, they are not wise according to the Holy Spirit of God as written through Paul. As Christians, our standard is the Bible. The ones who cry out, you can't judge me, seem often to miss this point. They think that when someone judges their behaviors or practices, that they are judging them as a person. That's usually because the one practice, practicing the sin often sees himself in terms of the sin. So when the sin is challenged, the person takes it personally. Because, you know, if I think that I'm uh, drunk in this, and you start talking about being drunk and how bad it is, then I'm going to say, hey, quit talking about me like that. Because I'm going to see myself in terms of the sin of drunkenness. <clears throat> the hard issue behind the action of a loving, loving another person enough to righteously judge his behavior is that he loves the one he challenges. I mean, why else would we put ourselves out like that? Why else would we turn to somebody and say, something that I see is concerning me because I care? For the one, I'm sure that those, there are those who do devalue others. I've seen them do that, considering them and their sin to be the same thing. I personally try not to do this. My grief in the whole matter usually has to do with knowing the person's potential in Christ and seeing it squandered for some transient earthly pleasure. For the one approached by his brothers in love and, and having his, his behavior challenged by those who love him enough to do something that uncomfortable, to in turn judge his brother for doing that, for loving him enough, you have people that judge us for loving him enough to judge their behavior. You know, they fall prey of the very thing that they're accusing the brother of doing. So if someone comes up and says, hey, I want to talk to you about something I've seen. And the first thing you hear is you're judging me and you're a bigot and all that kind of stuff. Then the person calling you a bigot is guilty of what they're accusing you of, of being a bigot. Isn't that interesting? And so, so um, that truly is the sort of judgment Paul speaks about in Romans 14.4. And 10 and 13. Many who cry out, you can't judge me, seem to camp on those verses and ignore ones like the following that indicate that righteous judgment is indeed correct to do. From the mouth of Jesus, Matthew 7, 1 to 2. Judge not that you be not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it'll be measured back to you. And then in Luke 12, 57, yes, and why, even of yourselves, do you not judge what is right? And in uh, verse uh, John 7, 24, do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. The truth is, is that we will seek to treat the word of God with respect. That if we'll do that, we, will, we won't cherry pick verses and just use the ones that make our case about anything. We must look at them all and allow the Spirit to cause us to, to emerge in us the picture of what he would have us to know about whatever it is he knows on any topic. Again, the issue is not really judgment. The real issue is fourfold. The first is the condition of human souls. Secondly, strongholds that exist in those souls that impede our growth as Christians and harm others in the process. They harm us and they harm others. Three, whether or not we love, it's whether or not we love one another enough to address those strongholds. And four, whether or not when we're challenged by our brethren, we have the humility and courage to self-check, to repent, and approach God to have our souls healed. That's the whole purpose. So just, just as a rule of thumb, if I feel something, okay, Marie, uh, Marie is a, a primarily a French-speaking Canadian. And so I'm going to try to talk a little slower. Marie, I get excited about what I'm doing, and I talk too fast. I'm sorry. So I'll go over that again. 
So the whole idea about judgment, whenever you hear the terms, don't judge me, or you can't judge me, or stop judging me, basically it's really a fourfold issue. The first is the condition of human souls. Without Jesus, it's a wreck. The second is strongholds. It's about strongholds that exist in people that impede our growth as Christians and harm us and harm others in the process. The third is whether or not we love one another enough to address those strongholds. And four, whether or not when we're approached by our brethren, we will have the humility and courage to self-check. And if we find something out of order to repent and to approach God to have our souls healed. And so um, John 12, 48, remember in 47, Jesus says that he doesn't judge. Well, let me go two pages back. He says, if anyone hears my words and does not believe, but do not judge him, for I did not come to the world to judge, but to save the world. And then here in 48, he says this, he who rejects me and doesn't receive my words, that has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. So can you see the difference? He's not there actively judging. He's putting out a standard. And that standard is what um, is going to be used to judge us. The Greek word translates here as rejects. He who rejects me literally means set aside. So are we setting Jesus aside? when someone comes to us and tells us about him. I have to tell you that one guy tried to lead me to Christ three different times between high school and college. And each time I set Jesus aside. So I praise the Lord, I kept breathing long enough to run across somebody that I could receive from. I did go back to that guy and, and told him three times, you were right and I was wrong. And uh, he was excited to hear that I'd been saved. So the term reject, and he who rejects me literally means set aside. Next part of the verse says, uh, and does not receive my words. The term receive not means to not seize and absorb and make your own. The word words is a Greek word rhema, which refers to the uttered words of God. It doesn't necessarily refer to the logos which is either Jesus or the Bible, depending on the context, which he still is speaking. The, the other words, God, the rhema, Jesus is still speaking to us. And uh, there are people who disagree with that uh, because the canon is closed. And the truth is, C-A-N-O-N, the canon, the scriptures are closed. We're not going to be adding to the word of God. Jesus says that people who do, not, who do this are already judged by what he has said. He is the life. There is no other source. So when people tell me I'm condemning them, I tell them that this is impossible. For one, I don't have the power to condemn anybody. Only God has that power. And they always label it condemnation and judgment while you tell the news and truth. For the other thing, they're already condemned to death if they're lost, and they're going to remain that way unless Jesus becomes their life. If you're dead, and if you have never received Jesus, you're lost, and all lost people are spiritually dead. You really need life, or are you going to remain dead? It's really as simple as that. In verse 49, Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say what I should say and what I should speak. And so I want to... Um, digress for a second to share something I saw in the Proverbs recently that fits here. Proverbs 18.10 in the New American Standard. It says this, The name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous runs into it and is safe. Now, I have taught in error, I think, that this means that, that Jesus or that Jehovah Jireh, or Jehovah Jireh, however you say that, or Adonai or some other term, or title of the Lord's is a strong tower. Taking a closer look, I saw something different. The term, the name of the Lord, and the name of, that term has to do with authority. It doesn't have to do with the specific name. 
Authority has to do with the right to rule. And I believe that when I run to God's authority, the name of, I am safe. When I run to his order, his rule, his power, his kingdom, these all have an effect on my situation. This is why so many, and this has been true of me at times, seem allergic to godly authority. We're tempted to not go there because the enemy doesn't want us to be safe. Once one of the women I passed her called from an airport in New York on her way to meet her husband who worked overseas in Turkey. She called. She ran to the name of the Lord, the authority. God works in her life. It made her feel safe. It gave me, it gave me a sense as a pastor that she was covered by God through me, a year, mere human, because I watch over her soul in the authority or in the name of God. And so it was an incredible sensation to be a part of that. When Jesus says this, John 12, 49, for I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say or what I should speak. He's talking about the very same spiritual mechanism, if you will. While living in a human body, Jesus allowed the authority of the Father to flow through him. That authority spoke a command. Jesus, in human skin, obeyed it. He only said and spoke what he was directed to speak. Now, the Greek word translated as said, because when I first read this, I thought, well, said and speak, that's the same thing. You know, the word said refers to anything we say in spoken or written words. It refers to just everyday things. The word speak has to do more with formal speaking, as in preaching and teaching. So Jesus saw this as an issue of incredible importance. He says in verse 50, and I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, what I speak, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Now, this is important because uh, somewhere in the future, Paul's going to say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And what he's trying to say there, what he's definitely saying is, I'm only ministering what I hear the Father telling me to minister. And he says, I want you to do that. So this is supposed to be our lifestyle. Our lifestyle is supposed to be in the name of, in the authority of the one who we belong to, the Lord. And so um, that's why we shouldn't just go about just because something looks like a good thing to do in ministry that we don't necessarily do that. It's a, it's a mind-blowing concept to me because we're called to imitate Christ. Considering what Jesus said in John 12, 49, that when we imitate Paul as he imitates Christ, it means that we are to speak only what we are told by the Father to speak and to say only what we're told by the Father to say. Now, when we do that, what will we, we'll be communicating? And so in the first part of John 12, 50, he says, I know that this command, his command is ever that lasting life. So the word life here is the Z-O-E life, Greek word that means perpetual life that comes from heaven. The Bible says in Romans 8, 6, the mind set in the flesh is death, but the mind set in the spirit is life and peace. When we consistently walk in the spirit, just whose word should we um, should be, in theory, flowing through us. This should be the Father's words. And when that happens, what you'll experience in the people that we speak to is they'll, they will sense life. You know, there are people out there that walk in the Lord that you just feel better being with. You know, and it's because you have an experience with God. I found that as a multitasker, I can walk in the spirit and out to the flesh simultaneously. And personally, I really believe everybody can do this. We will be doing what the Father says to do and somehow simultaneously not be speaking the words he's giving us or vice versa. Or I'll be doing one thing with my right hand in the spirit, moving in the flesh with the left. As we yield to him more and more consistently, I think that evens out. Just imagine that by simply saying what he says to say, people experience perpetual life. 
We have that ability in Christ. We have that right in Christ. And so uh, we're, we're closing up on, on John chapter 9. I mean, 12. as chapter 12 comes to a close, I'd like to share an interesting fact. The first 12 chapters of John covers three years. The next six chapters cover one single night. Chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. What a sobering thought this must have been. And, and imagine what it was like for John to write that. When we know it's time, it's always sobering. But what mixed emotions Jesus must have felt. He must have felt sadness to leave them, dread of the cross and separation from the Godhead as it became sin, anticipation that soon people would have a chance to choose life, and excitement to soon be back with the Father. Why was it time? Well, the second half of, of chapter uh, 13, verse 1, says, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He had done what he came to do. He loved those to the end. He didn't love them to the end of his time on the earth. No, rather, he loved them to the end. The word translated as, as end is a Greek word. It's teleos, T-E-L-O-S. It refers to completeness. Therefore, the term teleos doesn't refer to a time frame. Rather, it has to do with fulfillment, with a goal that's been reached. So Jesus loved them to the end. He loved them to the point of finishing what he wanted to accomplish. It signifies that he took them to the exact place in their growth, development, knowledge, faith, and so on that the Father told him to take them. In other words, they were fully equipped for what was about to happen, no matter how they felt about that, because what Jesus did was complete for them. I believe Jesus does this through the Spirit with us all the time. He brings us to teleos for different events and issues. Sometimes someone will be on the brink of a burst of healing or freedom, and it'll be his or her teleos for that. Sometimes I can just about smell it, spiritually speaking. I know it's about to happen. What a cold time. I mean, I've been in ministry and, and be um, mentoring somebody, and Somebody, I'm, you know, I've seen it before. Somebody, the person I mentioned to will walk out the room because it's one of those points. It's one of those times. We, we were ministering deliverance on the porch, a deck one night to uh, my friend Mark's next door neighbor. And she had all kinds of demonic interference in her life. And at one point she said, I'm going to throw up. And Satan will often lie to us and tell us that we're going to be sick or we have a headache or we can't hear or we want to kill somebody in the middle of a session like this. So I just called this bluff. I said, well, go throw up, you know. Go over and hang over the railing there and throw up. And she went over and I turned to Mark and I said, she's fixing to get free. I could just feel it. She was going to stick it out. She wasn't going to quit. You know what I mean? Um, you could just sense something's going to happen. And there are times when you're, you're ministering this and you know this is the time that God is going to complete this right now. And so that was a cool time. And, uh, and so now before the feast, we'll repeat verse 1. Before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus, Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who are in the world, he loved them to the end. He loved them to the completeness of, of what he had those, that core group of first soon to be Christians, what he had them for. This verse uses the word love twice. Now what does it mean? It's important that we know what it is if loving us is something he plans to do in regards to us continually 
for eternity, I think it's important we get a handle on what, what love is. If we were to study love, we would come to the biblical conclusion that it means something like this. The activity of knowing someone to the point of, of understanding what that person needs and doing one's level best to make sure that the person got what he or she needed with no conditions. I'm going to repeat that. This is what I believe Mike's definition of love is. I think it's the biblical definition. The activity of loving is the activity of knowing someone to the point of understanding what that person needs and doing one's level best to make sure that person gets that, what he or she needs. No conditions. When we love someone, we just do it. So verses like this one are about agape love. Philippians 4.19, and my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. And so why is that love? It's love because he knows what we need. And, and uh, he supplies it. That's what love is. It's good to see his love in his provision. Now Jesus is about to take his earthly goal to teleos. To the end and all through it he's going to love those people they're going to get what they need while they eat with them while they hear what he has to say while they fail him in the garden while they abandon him there while he's being tortured while he dies while he, his body rests in a tomb and while he resurrects they will be being loved they will have what they need he loved them they will have what they need, even when it seems like they don't. And you know, it's that way for us as well. We have what we need for one reason. Jesus loves us. And John 13, 2, and supper being ended, the devil, having already put it into the heart of Judas, is carried it, Simon's son, to betray him, to betray Jesus. Now let's note for a second. This is how Satan gets any of us to sin. He inserts something into our hearts. The word put in this verse literally means to throw something into Judas's heart or his soul. It's important that John reports this because Jesus is about to wash the feet of all the disciples, including the feet of Judas. Jesus washed Judas's feet knowing full well how he felt about Jesus. In other words, Jesus did not let Judas's heart determine how he would serve this man, Judas. As we follow Jesus, we must be this way if we're to represent him well. We will be tempted at times to be the other way and have lots of reasons for it. The Spirit can convict through that, but not if we get in the way and try to make it happen. A minister asked me recently, what do you do if, and he described the hypothetical person who rejected his ministry to him. And I said, I practice catch and release ministry, no strings attached. When we were in Africa, um, now some of the ministers, they were teaching about the Holy Spirit, and there was a, a big church that was um, abusing the Holy Spirit of God to attract business. And so people were leaving these humble little gatherings of people, some of them in church buildings, some of them like in huts, you know, or just like a carport or something. And, and he said, what do I do if one of the, my people wants to go and be a part of that? And I told him that when somebody wants to leave, um, what I do, I wish him well and I wave him bye-bye, you know? I mean, what do you do, you know? And so I told him I catch, I practice catch and release ministries, no strings attached. We must not let someone else's refusal to receive from us to control us. We have to love the person anyway. It's our right and our privilege to love people who do not love us. And sometimes that's really hard, or it can be. If we throw open the gates of our hearts and we let the spirit rip and run in us, it's going to be uncomfortable, but it won't be overly difficult. However, if we try to do it on our own in the flesh, well, then it's near impossible to accomplish. Once a mom frustrated with her druggy son said she knew 
that he knew that she didn't much like him at the time. And she asked me what she could do to try not to dislike him the way she did. <laughs> I think I remember who that is. That was kind of fun. Uh, my reply was to stop trying to like him and just love him with the love of the Lord, some of which will smell like mama love and some of which will seem harsh to him. This will be because the Lord will allow her son to fall over and, and not try to rescue him until he cries out to the Lord. I told that I thought that real love meant that he will be allowed to get what he wants and find it lacking. And what he wanted was drugs in the drug world and find it lacking so that he can seek real satisfaction in the Lord. How the heck can we turn to the Lord if we don't come to the place where the earthly stuff is so unsatisfying? That's what happened with me. Jesus knew Judas was going to betray him. He washed that man's feet anyway. Had he rejected Judas, he would essentially have been given Judas control over, over his own emotions and actions. And that would mean that the father wouldn't be in control of Jesus. Is that not our choice as well? In Romans 6, like about verse 10 or 12, something like that, 13, it says we are encouraged to choose a good master. Our two possible choices are sin and God. It seems to me that we should choose the one with the best record of caretaking. In other words, should I give control of my heart and actions over to someone who's going to betray me, or should I give control over to the Father who would have me forgive as he forgives and love as he loves? And so on supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas, this carried Simon's son to betray him. At first glance, this is a bit misleading. In the original Greek, apparently the meal hadn't started. But the food had been prepared, it was on the table. This is what the term supper being ended means. It's important because this is the Passover meal, and that's their point for being there that night. It's important to see this because Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover. What will he do? What, what will be the food and drink? Our receiving his life, his blood, his body, being in him will be the real point. So the ritual of eating that meal this time will not be as crucial as it had been in times past. It's also important that we can see the intervention of the devil here. He puts things in our hearts if we allow that. So there was Judas, something had been put into his heart to, to betray Jesus. Now we're going to see Jesus uh, in verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand. So here we have the Father putting something into Jesus' hand, and that's juxtaposed against Satan putting something bad into Judas' heart. Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and he was going to God. And this is crucial for us to see too. Jesus knew something. A lot about our lives is determined by what we know to be true, not what we suspect, what we know, and how we handle that. What did Jesus know? He knew that authority to accomplish had been granted to him from the Father. It's very important for us, especially when we feel out of control, to think about, okay, what can I do? What do I know? And, and if the fallback has to be this, it's a good fallback. I know that God loves me and he's got me. And so that's something that I know. And so he knew, Jesus knew that the authority accomplished had been granted to him. The Father gave it to him. The Father had given, it says. The word gave or given is the Greek word didomai, D-I-D-O-M-I. And one, re one really delicious definition of this to me is the word adventure. So let's look at that sentence like that. Jesus, knowing that the Father adventured all things into his hands. Sounds different, doesn't it? Jesus knew that God the Father had given him all the authority needed to accomplish his mission. But even more than that, all things were literally his. And this is referenced several times in the word. In, in uh, Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven 
and on earth. And in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, as in Adam all die, also in Christ all should be made alive. 1 Corinthians 15, 27, for he, God, the Father, has put all things in subjection under his, Jesus' feet. But when he says all things are put into subjections, it's evident that he accepted who put all things in subjection to him. And in Romans 11, 34 to 36, for who has known the mind of the Lord, or who became his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. All things belong to him. To him be the glory forever. This then is the Father taking authority back from Satan, in, to whose, in whose hands Adam had placed it. Isn't God different? He did that by being submissive to death. How did we die? We reach for life outside of God. How do we get real life? Jesus dies, and then we die in him. This is a supernatural thing. It has an earthly effect on us and an eternal one too. So in John 13, we see this, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, it was going to God. This very same dynamic is available to us right now. When we walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh, the Father will release us into arenas of authority. It is always his authority being imputed or, or, or given to us. All godly authority is granted. It's never seized. And to this day, Jesus apportions to us authority as he sees fit. For instance, if the Lord ordains one of us to lead someone to the Lord, God grants us that person. It is his authority to work through us. That is our realm to move in fully. This is why it's grievous to not fully move in the realms granted to us by the Father. What a waste. And what a waste of the worst sort. What a, it's spiritual waste. Nothing makes me crazier than this. When we move in that authority, the dynamic Jesus speaks of here is supposed to be at work in us. He grants us something of his. It comes from God through us. And we must go back to God. Now, one time I was in a prison. It actually happened to be as a, as a minister. Um, I was in a prison in Fort Worth, not too far from here, about 25, 30 minutes from here. And, and we had uh, some guy, a big name speaker was coming, and um, he was late. And they wouldn't tell us how late. Well, the prisoners were being held in a place where they couldn't get to their lunch. Lunchtime was coming. They were getting real restless. And I went up to the guy that was in charge of the group, and I, and I acknowledged his authority. I said, I know you're whatever the title was, the captain or whatever, for that group. I said, why don't you speak? Or why don't you get someone else to speak? And let's give the gospel to these guys because we're losing them. And he was afraid to make a decision. So I pulled him aside and I said, look, has anybody ever talked to you about what authority is? He said, well, yeah, I know what authority is. I said, well, I'd just like you to see this. The ministry we were with was Bill Glass Ministry. Bill Glass Ministry got his authority from the Lord to go in, and, and that authority worked through all of us to evangelize in prisons. And I said, and they have given you authority to make decisions about what's happening right here. I said, so... I'm not asking you to be rebellious or break a rule. They have given you the right to do this. And look at those guys' faces. They're starting to shut off and because they were thinking, you know, they wonder what they wanted. And so he says, well, I don't know anyone that's ever spoken in a prison. And I said, well, I didn't come up to you and tell you this so you would pick me. But at the time, I was teaching or preaching or whatever it was I was called in a county jail in Houston, Harris County Jail, once or twice a week. I've been doing it for three years. I want to doing it for four and a half. I said, I could do this. And he goes, go. And I said, I'll make you a promise. If the head guy ever shows, I'll stop right where I am, and I'll hand the baton off to him. He said, all right. So I wound up telling the story. 
And um, and there's a story I'm not going to mention, uh, but Sean knows the story real well. And and uh, and um, and the guys were just hanging on it, and and I, I threw down the gospel fairly fairly hard, and uh, a number of people responded to it. But what was really exciting about it was after they ate, I spent the whole day there. People kept calling me over to tell me about when they did what the story was about. And, and it was kind of fun, you know, but it wouldn't have happened if the guy hadn't used his authority. If he had wasted his authority, I don't know if these men would ever come to Christ. So maybe they would have, but I know for sure they did, you know, that day. And so all this reminds me the way it works. God apportions, he apportions authority, and then it, and then it comes back up to him through the people. And and it's like this. Um, so one day when my daughter, who's got two little kids of her own now, was sitting in the bathtub as a little bit of kid, she says, Daddy, where does this water come from? Well, I don't know if y'all know it, but I have a bachelor's degree in geography, so I like stuff like that. So I told her about the water cycle. And this reminds me of the water cycle. Water evaporates from the earth. It comes up. The sun, S-O-N, S-U-N, I don't know, heats it up. It goes up into the clouds, and then it condenses out, and it falls back to the earth wherever the Lord says that it's supposed to rain. And then the water evaporates from the earth, and it happens over and over again. Can you see the, path, the, the uh, pattern? Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God. When God gives me a role or a person or a blessing, or a realm, or anything, I must give it back to him because it's his, not mine. Romans 11, 36, through chapter 12, verse 1, says this, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. I urge you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. This is because everything belongs to Jesus. We must give it back if we're to walk in obedience and power. Now, we meet pretty simply um, in our homes. We call them gatherings because that's the literal translation of the word church. And so a gathering of the body of Christ at our home, I saw in the spirit lines connecting me to everyone present. I, mean, I could just like see it. It was like glowing. There was something I could see. People would say with my spirit. I knew that everyone there had similar lines, if not the same ones. I also knew that the supply from those lines came from the throne of heaven. And if I were to be a good steward of those people, it would be best for me to lift them to the Lord and to give them to him because they're his. Actually, one time we started a gathering where I had gotten a big uh, ball of yarn and I tied a loop on one end and I put it around my wrist and I threw it across the living room to somebody and I told them something. I, I just said, one time I saw you do this awesome thing. And I said, now I'd like you to throw it to someone else, hold your end, and then throw the ball to someone else that you saw doing something. And we just made sure that everybody was touched. Do you remember that, Lori? And, and there, when, there was a spider web of multicolored yarn and I said, okay, everybody hold it tight. And they, they held it tight. And all the pieces were touching each other. And I plucked one of them like a string. And the whole thing vibrated. And it was that thing. It was a, a similar to that thing. They were all connected. And everybody, all of us were still connected to heaven at the same time. And so if all these people come from God, they have to go back to him. We have to live our lives as if we don't belong to ourselves. Another person that was at that meeting saw the same thing emanating from me and saw that there was a flow in those lines that was regulated by whether or not each person received through the Lord. So there were people in the room that really didn't like me all that much and they weren't receiving that much. And other people, they just loved receiving from me. You know? And so I think that that's what it's really like. Uh, Galatians 2.20, verse, in the first half of 2.20, it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ that lives in me. So that day I was, in essence, a conduit from God to the people and then back to him through them. And this is what we all are as ministers to God. 
In John 13, 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God, it was going to go from God. So authority granted by God comes from the Father, returns to the Father. That's the pattern. How does Jesus practice that? He practices it by serving the Father, by serving the people. He stops observing the pattern of the feast, and he washes people's feet. He arose in verse 4 from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Now this is significant. Ritual was abandoned, and self-gratification in the form of a meal was abandoned to serve by Jesus, to serve those given to him. And this, I believe, is our pattern for godly authority. Those being served, those who are in leadership are to serve the people they lead. In John 13, 5, after that, he poured water into a basin. He began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Additionally, he doesn't let the hearts of those people determine how he's going to serve them. He knows Judas will betray him, and he still washes that man's feet. Now, one of the lowliest jobs for household servants was that of a, um, the slave who did the foot washing. This was symbolic of the cleansing ministry of Jesus, and it was an act of great humility. It seems to me that if a person in authority will not serve those that he has been graced by God to take care of and will not move in humility, he or she is, in essence, squandering that awesome gift from the Lord. Christian leaders who expect to be treated like royalty by those they consider to be less than them are not representing Jesus well at all. If we see each encounter as a gift from the Lord, we might not be as apt to move in pride or selfishness. We are an entire spiritual nation of kings and priests. Everybody is a king. Everybody is a priest. And this truth applies to all Christians. Whatever we do is done in a realm of authority that, that we have, which is granted from the Lord. And even if that realm might be my own little life, that's my realm. If I'm in the line at a department store, whoever's around me is a part of my realm. If I let someone step in front of me, I let someone in traffic go before me, am I not practicing that reign in a way that honors Jesus? Have you ever asked the Lord to purify or to perfect or to cleanse or complete you? Have you ever asked the Lord to have his way with you? Somewhere along the line, if you're a Christian, you asked him to own you, to be your Lord. No matter how long it's been, that still stands as an agreement between you and him. It is his right, for instance, to decide to practice that ownership by bringing an arrogant boss into your realm and giving you a chance to release something, pride, and replace it with something else that better represents God's kingdom, humility. He will do this so your soul can be more pure and also to touch the arrogant boss through you as you rule and reign in your realm on behalf of the king of glory. I'm aware that it's a lot easier for me to break that down than it is to live it, but I think we all have things like that. So how then can we break the cycle of responding emotionally to these things? Part of the answer lies in seeing the big picture. We must consider the source. What is the source of an arrogant boss's arrogance? Well, Satan is the source. To whom do you belong? You belong to Jesus. What we see here then is a kingdom clash. And inside, and inside us all, there is that clash between two kingdoms. It's occurring between what Satan has stored in us through rejections and hurts, etc., and what God has put in us through his son, his spirit, salvation, and through subsequent sanctification. So part of the answer lies in seeing what is really happening here. This is a war between an everlasting king and an evil despot. The enemy is desperate to keep whatever grounds he thinks he has in us. Another part of the answer is to use the anger as a clue. The anger, frustration, fear, whatever negative emotion you can think of, you name it, is a signal. 
It shows the presence of something the Lord wants to touch in us. It is a reaction to something Satan has left there to use against us and to use against others, and it has no place in God's kingdom in us. So I have a question that you can ask yourself when you, have, when you experience an emotional spike because something in your life is being threatened. How can you be robbed if you own nothing? And the answer, of course, is you can't. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, Paul says this, or, who, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? For you have been bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body. The, this term and concept was hard for me to accept. You are not your own. I am not my own. Wow. And there's another verse like it, just another chapter later in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 23. You were bought with the price. Do not become slaves of men. Who owns you? And who owns everything you do? Who will meet all your needs? The same person, the Father. How secure are we? We're completely secure. Some of us react poorly to this concept because we thought we owned ourselves, but when we were lost, who really functionally owned us? Do we really own ourselves? In Ephesians 2, it says that we walked in obedience to the course of the world, to the prince of the power of the air. This verse tells us that prior to being saved, we walked or we lived habitually according to an obedience to the prince of the power of the air, Satan. He was, in essence, our functional father before we were born again. And that begs the question, how good a father is Satan? Well, he's out to steal, kill, and destroy, according to Romans, I mean, John 10, 10. So Satan is not a good owner. And I ask this question because I understand struggle and hard times. However, I think it's important to recognize that even if our lot is hard, it's worse for unsaved people. We must step back and see it from the Lord's perspective, for what it, which is what the mind of Christ, spoken of in 2 Corinthians 2, is really all about. It's his viewpoint. When we live up, in, up close and personal, especially if we isolate ourselves from other believers, all we will see is the struggle. We got to this place in the study of the Gospel of John by watching Jesus be a better owner a humble one, who washed the feet of those he was given to disciple and care for. We talked of how, even if we aren't an official leader, we have a realm. And in that realm, no matter how small it seems, we can move just like Jesus does, in humility. It will affect the realm we've been given, even if we're dealing with the creepy boss or a mean person in traffic or an unruly child or whatever it is. 1 Corinthians 7.23 again, you were bought with the price. Do not become slaves of men. Sometimes I am the man to which I am the slave. I put demands on my life that the king would never bind me up with. And I'll become slave of my own demands, of my own expectations, of my own hopes. I'll say stuff like, but I have to do this, or I need to do this, or I'm supposed to do this. None of it's true. 1 Corinthians 7.23 encourages me to not be a slave to any man, even myself. In John 13, we see this awesome display of humility. Jesus leaves the feast, rose from the supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel, girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wiped them with the towel to which he was girded. That's our king. Our king really is a better owner. When I was one of many ministers at a large church in, in Houston, my area of prison ministry was important enough to be used as a marketing tool. The church made a big deal out of the fact that we did this thing Jesus said to do. We visited prisoners, but it wasn't important enough to pay me a full-time salary. So I served in a full-time capacity as a volunteer chaplain at the Harris County Jail in Houston and trained and led a team of volunteer prison ministers on evangelistic prison ministry trips, but I was only paid a quarter of the salary paid to other ministers. 
One day I and another man put together a team of people to go paint a house of an elderly lady in a really bad part of Houston. We met up at the church building and one of the real, I'm just joking with that, real full-time paid ministers on staff came downstairs and he made fun of us because we were all dressed in our dirty, ratty clothes. He asked what we were doing and I told him we were gonna go take care of this widow. I said, why don't you go home, change clothes and come help us? And his response was infuriating. He says, I'm a working minister. Well, truth be told, I wasn't really kind about it. I rushed the guy and, and he just pinned himself against the wall and I was pretty harsh. I said, what do you think we are? Now, what we had there was a, a guy that worked in an office and a guy that was um, spraying for bugs. He was an exterminator and a guy who worked with his hands during carpentry, all kinds of people, you know? All of them were gonna go minister to a widow, which Jesus said to do. Jesus was a minister. He was a real minister. He knew where he was authority-wise, and it showed in his service. People in authority are there to serve those over whom they minister, not the other way around. I said, what do you think we are? You know, we, we put our, I mean, it was a, it was a wonderful, experience it was a bad place at night the police were riding three policemen to a car and there were helicopters flying over all night police helicopters it was really a rough part of north houston the lady's house was so bad that she was actually prayer walking the whole time we worked on her house we worked on it for like four or five days it was so bad that you could see her walking on the other side of the house through the cracks in the house. And she just walked around. She was about 90 years old. I think she was 89. And she was praying. And um, and people started coming up to us and asking, because half of us were white, half of us was black, and this was an entirely black neighborhood. And this old guy walked up, and he goes, hey, what are you doing here? And he said, well, we're helping Miss Effie, I think her name was, with her house. And he goes, why? And we said, because well, Jesus said to. And he went, oh. He said, what else does Jesus say to do? And one of the guys, Eddie Klein, he said, well, sir, he tells us to pray for people, lay hands on the sick and heal. And all of a sudden he goes, he walked, he's going, all right. And he walked up and he said, can you come in and pray for my wife? And his wife had been bedridden for a number of years. And we went into this home, might have been, I don't know, only white people ever been in the house, anointed her with oil and prayed for her. And then a heroin addict came up and asked me to go pray for his mother, who was across the street and had had both of her legs amputated. It was, the house was so bad that you could see through the cracks in the floor and you could see the rat turning around in the house. And we went into that place. And, and the next thing you know, this lady and her friends put together their, government cheese and their government bread and their lunch meat and served us a feast. You know, it was beautiful. I mean, we scraped that house, we caulked it, we, we replaced wood, we, we uh, put a base coat on it. We, every day we'd take all our stuff so it didn't get sold for somebody to buy heroin with. You know, it was a beautiful experience that we got to experience and we didn't have to. We just did it because the Lord said to. You know, I'm a working minister, so I guarantee you. We all came home. The house was blue. We sanded that house. We all came home looking like Smurfs. Black, white, we're all blue, you know, from all the dust. Um, we all looked like Smurfs, no matter what original skin color it was. It was awesome. When we were done, the lady was just crying. The government was going to take her house away because she signed it over to HUD. And because it was in poor shape and she couldn't afford it, she signed it over because she couldn't afford it. They were going to take it away from her. She was born in that house. So we went and took care of her. She got to keep her house. So he washed their feet. So um, we're going to uh, pick up here next time. It's, it's almost 8 o'clock. I went over because I told extra stories. But I think, um, I think they were good stories. You know, I just want to urge you, the Bible says um, in Acts, I'm working on Acts now, preparing the next study. And in the book of Acts, 
um, he's going to tell them right at the beginning to go out and be witnesses. What that literally means is to say what you've seen. See, what has God showed you? What have you experienced? Um, I think if I experience something and it goes into my eyes and into my head, and I'm the only one that experiences it, then me and whoever's there to experience it, the only ones that are going to really benefit from it. But there's going to be times when the Lord's going to say, I want you to talk about what you saw. That's what witness means. It doesn't necessarily mean to knock on strangers' doors and give them a piece of paper, inviting them to some event, <laughs> or even to leave a tract there. That's good things to do. But the word witness literally means speak about what you saw God do. And so there's going to be times, and today I felt like you tapped me on the shoulder, if you will, and said, tell that story about Miss Effie. It's not to brag, um, but I was there and you weren't there, so you can't tell that story. I have to tell that story. And so um, I'd, like, I'd, like, I'd like for us to have possibility thinking about how to obey the Lord, how to practice this Christianity stuff, how to live in, in this life to be a part of other people. And so tell your story. If you've seen something awesome happen that God orchestrated, talk about it. If you're the person used, well, you're not bragging on you. You're bragging on him. That's what witness is, Gary. That's exactly what it is. So um, we're going to end here for tonight. I appreciate y'all coming in the U.S. This is a holiday. I just felt like we were supposed to do it, so we came anyway. And um, Big Mike wasn't here. He's got a family thing going. Miss Mary couldn't make it. Um, there's some things going on with her. And so um, Mark just showed up. Hey, Mark, I love you, brother. Uh, we're going to close out. This study will be, um, you can go to uh, uh, this place. Oops, I didn't type it into place. If you don't put it into place, you're not going to be able to type it. Where is it, W? Uh, and it doesn't matter what you type if you don't put the curse in the right place, right? Hey, I'm going to know about it, all these computers. Um, tomorrow you can go to that website, maybe late tonight. I will have loaded this study up to YouTube. Uh, I pull them off Facebook, put them on my computer, send them off to uh, YouTube. That way, Facebook scrolls by pretty quick, but you can always find uh, these things easily. You can go to the videos. The newest one's always the first one. Also, there's about 230 some odd articles there. I appreciate the support. Um, Y'all being here is support. So I pray, I praise God for that. I'm gonna pray. We're gonna head on home. We have to clean up. We cook supper. I got to go home today, be home today and cook supper while Laurie worked on her school stuff. And now I gotta go clean up my mess. I love you guys. Let's pray. Father, I ask you to show us uh, what our realms are that you have given us. You've given authority to us. We saw that in Matthew 28, that Jesus um, says all authority has been given to me, and now I give it to you to go out as you are going to make uh, disciples, baptizing and teaching. And uh, whatever our realm is, that you show us what that is, that we have the right to rule and reign in it, we have the right to speak to it. I ask you to speak to us and guide us about when uh, to say things and, and when to be quiet, when to do things, when to do nothing, uh, how to approach people. I ask you to show us how to love um, the way you love us. And I ask you, when we're the leader in those realms, show us the opportunities to serve those other people. I thank you for that. I praise you for it. Thank you for your word. And I thank you that, um, that you touched the hearts of someone on Facebook to let us have this technology, to teach this way and to learn this way and to communicate and be a big community this way. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Amen, you guys. I love y'all. You know, you see somebody step on the side of the road, you think you're supposed to go? That's your realm, baby. Rule and reign. Serve somebody. See y'all later. God bless y'all. Love y'all. Bye-bye.